Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Uh, if you hear some talking in the background, that's Jennifer listening to the latest George Webb. That's W-E-B-B. I think I've shared it before. Uh, expose of uh, DynCorp and uh, amazing series that he's producing. So if you haven't listened to that, just uh, type into YouTube George Webb, W-E-B-B, and it's called DynCorp. Uh, and it goes into all the corruption, organ harvesting, drug trafficking, child sex trafficking, just horrible, horrible stuff. But unfortunately, that appears to be the reality of this world. So this is the silver chart, daily chart. And a couple of things I've drawn in here. This formation here actually kind of looks like the formation back at 26. I'll, I'll take a look at that in a second when we look at the weekly. But uh, you can see that this was a, a series of uh, lower highs uh, down to a flat line of testing of that low that was around 19 bucks, And it took a long time. You can see it took nearly a year to break through that, but it did. It broke down through there, and that's when we got the plunge to the lows. And uh, so you can see here that what we're doing right now is we're testing uh, this other trend line here. I've drawn in the downtrend line that uh, we're just touching up to tonight and actually backing off of it a little bit. So those are the two important points. This line here, which represents all of this overhead and uh, this overhead too, really. And then this line here, which is... Uh, the trend line that we need to get through. Uh, the most bullish thing we could see is absolutely a punch through both of these up to 19 or even through 19. That is going to be a very bullish continuation move. Uh, or the opposite, we could get a touch off of this and a complete failure. Uh, that could be in the cards. That definitely would be in line with this trend line although I'm expecting at least a retest of this area. So we're going to see that in the next couple of days, probably uh, maybe a test of 19, but uh, we did get through 18. We touched right through that. You can see we're at 1791. Uh, pull up to the minute chart. Uh, monthly, I'm sorry. Minute chart, and you can see there we got that uh, punch up there through uh, up to 18.07 and then a furious sell off. Let's pull up the volume on that. See that pretty big volume sell off right there after it got through 18. Big smack down and then a recovery and you can see this is where we are right now. So out to the weekly I was describing uh, what occurred at the 26 price. So you can see a similar pattern that I showed you. On the other chart, this is actually a bigger formation. You can see that this one went from a beginning of 2011 all the way to midway through 2013 before it uh, broke down right there. Similar sort of pattern. This is going to be the next area of resistance as we move up in the expected bull market. And so let's go to the main story of the night related to this, the eventual expected bull market in silver that never comes seemingly. And this is on Silver Doctors. It's the latest from SRS Rocco. And this is production just plunged at the world's largest primary silver mine. So I'm going to read this and then talk a little bit about this issue about primary silver mines and, and secondary uh, silver mine. Silver mine is a byproduct. Well, this is interesting. The largest primary silver mine in the world experienced a huge decline in its production due to falling ore grades. The Cannington mine, now run by South 32 Limited, suffered a huge drop in its silver production during its first half 2017 reporting time period. Some companies such as South 32 start their fiscal new year in July. BHP Billiton, who owned the Cannington mine since its startup in 1997, spun it off to South 32 back in 2015. According to South 32's production report, the Cannington mine saw its silver production drop by a staggering 27% in 2017's first half versus the first half of 2016. Now, 
that this is actually something that is uh, mimicked worldwide in uh, the rest of the mines, then obviously that would be an unbelievable uh, change in the market. We know we've analyzed the uh, silver uh, reports about the uh, mining and the deficit and how there's been a deficit. We're talking at a, we're running about a billion ounces a year uh, being consumed and we're mining somewhere eight to nine hundred and then there's a difference being made up of all these funny numbers that we've looked at a lot of times. So if you can imagine if you took 27 percent off of a billion and you were looking at 730 million ounces being mined, uh, where are they going to come up with those 270 million ounces every year? Uh, without having higher prices. Uh, maybe they will ramp up uh, secondary, and that's what we're going to talk about. So here's the chart. Cannington mine silver production. You can see 11 million ounces down to 8.7 million ounces. Silver production at Cannington mine declined from 11 million to 8.7, 11.9 to 8.7. Basically, these figures are comparing production from July to December 2015 to July to December 2016. Again, the latter reporting period is first half of 2017. Regardless, this is a huge drop in silver production from the world's largest primary silver mine located in Australia. Here's the actual table. The reason for the big drop in silver production at Cannington was due to the huge decline in silver ore grade at the mine. The average silver ore grade fell from 266 grams per ton uh, first half 2016 to 198 uh, GT grams per ton in the first half of 2017. Falling silver ore grades are nothing new for Cannington. It has been going on for quite some time. The world's largest primary silver mine once produced silver at an average grade of 636. So you can see that's a decline of 67%, two thirds down from 636 to 198, more than three times its current silver grade. Now here's the chart. And you can see that it's been falling from some time, basically a peak in 2005 and been falling uh, in that ore grade. Here we can see Cannington's average silver grade decline, ore grade decline from 636 to 255 in 2016 during its peak year in 2005. Cannington produced 44 million ounces of silver, an average ore grade of 515. This one single mine produced more than half a billion ounces of silver since 2000. The chart above was one of 48 published in my silver chart report. He goes into his silver chart report. Even though production has continued to decline at Cannington, it was still the largest primary silver mine in 2015. And you can see in this chart here, hopefully you can see it, I'll make it larger. Uh, we've got this Ducat mine uh, in Russia. I don't think you're going to see any of that exported. Maybe you will uh, if they're dumb. And then you've got, or maybe they need hard currency. You've got Cannington second, and uh, the Sacito in Mexico, Guatemala, Mexico, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, United States, Argentina, Morocco, Turkey, Peru, Bolivia, Mexico, Mexico. A lot of them in Mexico. Uh, very interesting with the Mexican peso. Let's pull that up real quick here because that was a very interesting chart that I was noticing the other day. Uh, the Mexican peso is kind of forming a very bizarre chart pattern in relation to the U.S. dollar. Uh, I think you can see it probably on the 8-hour. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's the daily, I guess. So if you draw your lines in here, let's switch over to lines. Give me a second here. This is a little bit tricky. It doesn't like to do that. So what I see here is kind of a fan formation. Now this is a very unusual formation to have in really any market. I'm going to draw in uh, two sets of lines on both ends because we have a kind of a fan formation here and I'll show you. So it's kind of fanning out. Do you see that? That that indicates that the volatility is increasing. This huge spike here was the Trump election spike that you can see they thought Hillary was going to win. This again, this is 
the US dollar versus the Mexican peso. So as this goes up, that means the peso is going down in value. 22 pesos to the dollar uh, from versus 2014, almost a 50% drop in the value of the peso since that time frame. But you can see here this fan pattern of the peso increasing its volatility and this pattern is, is still going. So the next test is gonna be down to these two trend lines and uh, then maybe a bounce up there. That's indicating to me extreme uncertainty in the future of the Mexican currency. Now it would seem to be in Mexico's interest since they have one, two, three, four of these uh, primary mines. They probably have uh, more mines that aren't on this list. For the price of silver to go up significantly, that would make Mexico much wealthier. But again, do they have the power to influence that when we're looking at the power of this cartel? This table from the Silver Institute shows the Cannington mine ranked second in 2015 behind the Polymetals Ducat mine in Russia. However, revised data show the Cannington mine actually produced 22.6 million ounces. So when the Silver Institute publishes their updated primary silver mine data for 2016, they will put Cannington into the number one spot for 2015. That being said, Cannington will fall to the number two spot in 2016 when all the data is finally released. According to the data released by the mining companies, here are the production results. And uh, the top four are Fresnillo, South Cannington, Tahoe, Escobol, Polymetals, Ducat. Now, one thing that's interesting here is if you add these numbers together, the top four, just say you throw in the top five, you're going to get about 100 million ounces of silver. Now, that's 10% of what we consume each year. So it doesn't seem like these primary silver mines are mining much of the silver. You can see a tremendous drop off here. Uh, once we get out of the top five, really, actually top four, you can see we drop down to 15, 13. We're below 10 at number seven, and then it just gets worse from there. So, and this is, you know, how much of a percentage is this? This is really only about 10%. This whole thing added together, 10, 15%. So where's all this silver coming from? It has to be coming from the secondary silver mines. Regardless, to see silver production fall 27% at Cannington is quite amazing when we know its tremendous production history. South 23 states that the Cannington mine will extract higher grade silver ores in the second half of the year, but production is estimated to only reach 19 million ounces for the year. When U.S. and global oil production starts to decline in a big way, silver production will feel it most. Why? because byproduct silver supply from copper, zinc, and lead production will fall precipitously as base metal demand plummets during a net financial crisis and economic crisis. Best time to invest in physical silver is before the supply evaporates or before its price or value heads towards Jupiter. I agree with that 100%. I still think we're in the calm before the storm. But let's examine this thesis here that... Uh, Silver as a byproduct will be affected tremendously when the production of base metal uh, declines precipitously because of base metal demand. And this is going to be my question, and I don't know the answer to it. You tell me what you think. Is base metal demand connected to the supply of base metal? Let's take a look at one of our favorite things to look at here, Kitco's historical charts. So keep in mind that he told us, I don't have any reason to doubt this, I think this is correct, copper, zinc, and lead are the two base metals that are fundamentally related to silver as a secondary uh, uh, product. So let's look at these. Let's start with copper. And what I want you to concentrate on here is two things. The five-year copper chart... and the five-year copper warehouse stocks. So looking at the warehouse stocks, you can see relatively on a historical basis, they're fairly low. Uh, they did have a huge spike in 2013, and then that was completely worked off uh, to very low. Now, one of the theses that is his article is based on is that that there's this connection between supply and demand. Of course, that's 
standard market fundamentals. But do you see a connection in this five-year copper spot price with this warehouse? I don't. I can see a huge spike in warehouse stocks in 2013 and a huge plunge in 2014. Shouldn't that correspond with the price of copper? Where we had a huge spike of price where we just had a falling, uh, I mean a huge price, a uh, huge spike of, of copper stock when we had just this kind of steadily falling price. And the same thing, uh, a plunge. Why is there a disconnect? That's my big question. Why is there a disconnect between the price of copper and the supply of copper? Something else is going on here. So let's look at the next one. What was it? Zinc, lead, and copper. Yeah. The next one is zinc. Same sort of thing we want to be looking at here. Five-year zinc spot price. So you can see with zinc, uh, we had a, a pretty big depletion in the stocks. Uh, bottoming in about November of 2015 and then a huge run-up uh, a doubling a doubling of the price here so zinc hit a low in 2015 and doubled uh, right up to where it is now now here's the warehouse stock levels so how does that correspond it looks like the warehouse stock levels are have been falling consistently. It's the same sort of thing we saw in copper. Uh, these aren't lining up. Same thing. Let's take a look at lead. Five-year lead spot price. We've got a fairly steady price for 2012, 13, and 14. Drop in 2015 and then a, a bump up to where we are today. And here is the warehouse stock levels, just kind of steadily falling. Same thing. So what's going on? Well, it's, it's my contention that silver is the most manipulated market in the history of the world, uh, ever. And the people who are doing it are the same people who are manipulating and controlling everything. That's the bankers. That's the Illuminati. That is the really, really bad people who run everything. These people do not want the people to have a choice. That's why they're pushing their cashless society. That's also why they're suppressing the price of silver before everything blows up because they don't want people to have it to protect themselves. So it's my contention, and I've mentioned this before, that the mining companies are completely compromised. They are not companies that are operating for a profit. They're not companies that are operated independently. They have interlocking boards and they have people who are saddling them with debt. Uh, and as far as the Fed is concerned, the Fed can print up a trillion dollars, uh, doesn't even need to print it. It can just enter it as a digital entry with a keystroke and a trillion dollars comes into existence. Can the Fed hand that money to miners? Absolutely. Is that basically government mining? Yeah, that's, that's what it is. But can they do it? Yes, they can and I believe they have been. Now the question is, what happens when the ore grades fall so much and uh, we get tremendous surpluses of these other, uh, these secondary metals? We're not anywhere close. Sorry, my computer crashed and I'm resuming recording. So hopefully this works. If it doesn't work, I'll have part one and part two. So as I was saying, um, what is behind all of this and how much can they continue to manipulate it? So if we're going to go off these stocks, especially the, the three main ones, the warehouse stock levels of zinc and copper and lead, and we can see that they're all pretty low. They're not the lowest they've ever been, but they're pretty low, especially zinc. So they have plenty of room to run. If they need to ramp up production, uh, they're, they're set in a position where they've got low stocks in the warehouse. They can boost up the prices and run that up and uh, bail themselves out again. And so we'll see if that's what they do 
uh, to get this silver that they can't find. And we'll talk to you next time.